Um, welcome everyone. I think most people have arrived, so we're going to crack on. Um, welcome President Birmingham, members of the judiciary, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, good afternoon and thank you so much for coming today. Um, I'm Deirdre Malone, I'm Executive Director of the Irish Penal Reform Trust and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to this event today, which is sold out, so hottest ticket in town, mm. we're delighted to say. Um, so it's Detention, Human Rights and the OCCAT, um, and it's co-hosted by ourselves at the Irish Penal Reform Trust and the Irish Criminal Bar Association. And this is the 14th uh, Prison Law Seminar in a series, and we are always really pleased to welcome our supporters and our friends in the legal profession. Uh, to share your expertise with us and to encourage development of litigation in this area of prison law. Um, this afternoon's event is one that we hope is particularly timely, um, given that the Minister for Justice and Equality has given a commitment now that legislation intended to ratify the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture will be introduced by the end of this year. So this afternoon we have an expert panel of four speakers. Our first speaker today is Liam Herrick. Well, for people who are not familiar with um, the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture, um, to first of all say as those what it is, um, the UN Convention Against Torture is an international treaty which sets out obligations on states' parties to take steps to prevent uh, torture in human integrating treatment. And the optional protocol which was agreed in 2006, it came into effect in 2006, is an instrument to supplement the Convention Against Torture to create specific mechanisms to assist states in um, meeting their requirements. So it provides for two specialist mechanisms to be set into, into place. The SPT, the Subcommittee for the Prevention of Torture, which is an international body which carries out inspections from an international perspective but then the innovative part is the obligation on states' parties to establish what's called a national preventative mechanism at the national level. But it's very clear from both the work of the UN Committee Against Torture and now the work of the SPT and indeed the other bodies such as this uh, Special Rapporteur on Torture that it adopts a broad definition of what is meant by detention. And that is, I suppose, a crucial point for um, the point we're at here about how you would design the remit. Uh, traditionally, we looked at criminal justice detention with regard to prisons and police settings. Of course, we don't have any inspection of police settings here uh, that would qualify. We do have inspection of prisons, albeit in a very limited form, and we have inspection of uh, mental health institutions. But there are the other places where de facto detention um, would, would uh, give rise to obligations. Um, I suppose even in the very cl classical sense of detention, already there's issues such as military service and immigration detention are obvious areas recognized at law. But when we get into uh, the other types of uh, settings, we're looking at things like direct provision, um, healthcare settings, nursing homes, where de facto people can be detained. There are some concerns that in, in so far as the state has even begun the conversation about how you define places of detention and deprivation of liberty in Ireland, the Department of Health had a consultation earlier which took um, a very, very conservative and limited approach to what might be considered to be detention in an Irish context. And I think uh, we need to look at issues such as the um, use of private institutions, the state is trying to restrict, limit to very public institutions, but of course, as we know, public, in, public functions are carried out in private settings, uh, particularly with regard to nursing homes. So far, the government has only brought forward proposals for a criminal justice inspectorate, which would be an expansion of the inspector of prisons, potentially with uh, covering prison uh, policing, and perhaps being uh, in some way linked in with the inspection of places of, of um, mental health detention. Um, that clearly would be insufficient. Um, so we really are, I think, in a difficult place in terms of what the intentions of the government are. Um, but I look forward to hearing from Laura about a model of what this probably should look like if it were to be put into place. As your government moves towards ratifying OPCAT, hopefully, hopefully, this is what it should be considering when establishing its own national preventive mechanism. So Article 3 of OPCAT requires that states set up 
designate or maintain one or several visiting bodies for the prevention of torture and ill treatment. And these visiting bodies are referred to as the National Preventing Mechanism or NPM. And OPCAT goes on to set out the role of the NPM. So at the very minimum, NPMs <coughs> must have these powers that are set out in this slide. So they must regularly examine the treatment of detainees with a view to strengthening protection against torture. And they also must make recommendations to the relevant authorities to improve treatment and conditions. And they can also submit proposals and observations around existing or draft legislation, and we might call that the kind of policy function of the MPM. Um, so I just wanted to make a few key mention a few key features of our model. So we're a multi-body model. We now actually have 21 members. Um, and then for many types of detention in the UK, we have two layers of monitoring. So we have um, very frequent monitoring by lay bodies, um, such as independent monitoring boards for prisons. And we have much more in-depth professional inspection by organisations such as HMICS, where I work. Our NPM also includes members whose remit goes far beyond detention monitoring. So for example, at HMICS, we inspect policing generally, and police custody is just one part of what we do. Um, so our role at HMICS is to inquire into the state efficiency and effectiveness of Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority. And we have the power to do anything we consider necessary or expedient when we're doing our inspections. So in recent years I've seen our team do inspections of local policing, of call handling, undercover policing, counter corruption, firearms licensing, the list just goes on and on. Um, but the key point is that OPCAT ensures that custody is always on our agenda no matter what our other priorities are. Being a member of the NPM has really encouraged us to take a human rights based approach to inspections. We have a custody inspection framework which is based on international human rights standards and which helps ensure a consistent and objective approach to our work. So we don't just inspect about against Police Scotland's own custody policy, we take a much broader look at what should be happening within police custody. And our methodology is always also human rights based. And I just wanted to finally talk about the sources of evidence we use in our inspections. Um, I wanted to highlight the last one, which might be particularly relevant to many of you. Um, so while we do our unannounced visits, as well as talking to detainees and staff, we take the opportunity to talk to any other professionals that we can find in the custody environment. That could be doctors and nurses, appropriate adults, and solicitors who might be attending to meet their clients. And in relation to solicitors, we also try to meet with them outside of the custody environment. So we invite them to tell us about their experience of attending at the police station and about how their clients are treated. And this isn't intended to stray into client confidentiality. It's more focusing on their kind of general impressions or recurring themes that they experience while they're, while they're in custody. And that really helps inform our findings and recommendations. Also, the evidence gathered um, and the reports published by NPM members can be particularly useful in legal actions taken by you and your clients. And I don't know if that's something that already happens in Ireland, but certainly in the UK, inspectorate reports can be used to provide an independent and credible picture of what's actually happening in a particular place of the action. <laughs> in terms of the applicability of off-cash to non-prison settings, I think there is a as we can see from, from Laura's slides, there's a huge number of areas where um, OFCAT will have applicability once it's ratified. The, as a solicitor who practices in criminal law and, and regularly attends guard stations, there is a dearth of information in respect of the conditions at guard stations. The, the very high watermark cases, which would be very obviously unconstitutional, they can be remedy, remedied by way of an Article 40, say if, if a, a prisoner who is very, very unwell in a guard station and is not being given medical treatment, that can be remedied very quickly. But there is not a huge amount of information about the conditions um, that persons detained for questioning in a guard station are subject to. I know that um, Dr Vicky Conway and Professor Yvonne Daly of DCU are in the process of car carrying out a very uh, wide-reaching a survey on those, but I think it's something that OCAT will undoubtedly, um, once it's ratified, you know, inspections of, of guard stations and the conditions uh, to which people are subjected to uh, can't be anything other than uh, helpful. Uh, similarly, uh, prison escorts, 
is an area which is not currently subject to um, visiting committees or um, any real scrutiny and the the obvious examples there is, is it just relating to safety but also to areas which might not previously previously have been considered such as where prisoners are taken for long journeys that they would have um, access to rest or to um, uh, other facilities when they finish that journey that's something which is not necessarily considered at the minute in terms of juvenile um, or juveniles in care settings or um, uh, detention settings I think that is very relevant and also as Liam has picked up on on the private aspect of that in, in circumstances where there is a huge growth in, in private enterprises coming into Ireland to set up um, secure care facilities. It's certainly an area for um, further further scrutiny. Outside of the outside of the penal context, I think there can't be any argument against scrutiny of direct provision centres. And I think only in the last week uh, there was a case reported, which um, is not necessarily on point to to this evening's topic, but it was to do with a um, birth certificate and birth registration where a person who had been um, detained in a direct provision centre, uh, she had had a relationship with a security officer at the direct provision centre and, and the case entered on uh, his permission to register his name on the child's birth certificate that resulted from the relationship. But I think that is one of only a number of worrying um, uh, issues that we see emerging from the direct pr provision process uh, regularly. So uh, I think, again, the scrutiny of OPPAC could only be welcomed. And then I, I note with the incoming Assisted Decision Making uh, Act and uh, the, the cases that are emerging from the High Court uh, almost on a monthly basis now to do with detention and um, to do with detention and, and the rights of people who are in these uh, care settings that doesn't necessarily have any one governing body. I mean, you know, prisons, the IPRT play a very clear role in policing and, and, and highlighting uh, miscarriages of justice and, and, and worrying trends, but there are those gaps, um, such as persons in nursing homes or in, in, in mental institutions, where they're not necessarily being scrutinised to the extent that they should. So uh, on that note, um, I would just paraphrase the American uh, lawyer Louis Brandeis when I say that um, sunshine is the best disinfectant. So I think my wish list for 2019 is for the ratification of, of OPCAT. And I hope that when we're meeting again this time next year, we will be looking back on that development. Very importantly, and this is something that I think is far too invisible in an uh, Irish conversation, is uh, that people um, are at risk of abuse, not only in our uh, psychiatric hospitals, but in community residences around the country that are entirely unregulated, um, and uh, for which the inspector has found, even in, a, in an ad hoc inspection of 43 of these facilities, that 14% of them have locked doors. Um, so people uh, do, there are, I think, very serious issues in terms of, um, uh, uh, of the risk uh, within various settings that are either actual formal detention or de facto detention. At the moment, we're operating in a, in a system where we work with older people, vulnerable adults, and healthcare patients, where there is no system, in a sense, or no process before law where a person gets uh, maybe deprived of their liberty without having any process in law to determine this, or where they have no opportunity to have their voice heard. We're also operating in a system where we don't have the capacity legislation is in place, so the person's autonomy is very much undermined or negated <coughs> in the process. So one of the issues that we come across quite regularly is um, the process in which a family member, in a sense, is the person deciding if somebody is going into a nursing home care or going into a residential setting or a care mm -hmm. setting is a term I'll use for all of them, where a family member is the person signing the forms or signing the nursing home support scheme application form where no effort or no attempt is made to obtain a person's consent or where the person lacks capacity to give consent, no process is in place in law to determine what the person's wishes were or how those wishes may be followed. So what we are asking you to do uh, is very, whether you're a, a legal professional, a legislator, a member of the judiciary, an advocate, 
or a person supporting someone who's in a place where they're, where they're deprived of their liberty is to keep OPCAT on your agenda and to engage with the legislation when it is introduced. And we hope that you will analyze it against some of the things that you've heard here today. And also maybe to draw an eye in, in your packs. IPUT has put together principles. It's much broader. It's the general principles that we believe should underpin any legislation that's brought forward and is broader than prisons. Um, so keep your eye on IPRT, Channels of Communication, and the Irish Council for Civil Liberties, because we will be broadcasting loud and clear when this legislation appears. We will also be broadcasting loud and clear if it does not appear. So Thank you.